All right. In this video, we're going to be talking about the three most common types of carbocation shifts that you can see in this course. Hydride shifts, methyl shifts, and ring expansions. Let's start with hydride shifts. First of all, how do we recognize when we are going to do a shift? Well, the fundamental idea of any shift you undergo is that you want to make a carbocation move to a more stable position. Let's say we underwent a mechanism and somehow ended up with a carbocation on this secondary carbon. Okay? Well, what do we know about carbocation stabilities in terms of the degree of carbon? We have been taught that tertiary carbocations are always more stable than secondary carbocations, and those are more stable than primary carbocations, assuming there's no resonance involved or anything like that. If it's just substitution, the more carbons you have connected to the carbon that's positive, the more stable it will be. But this is what we have to be on the lookout for now. At this point in the course, we're going to assume that you are aware of shifts and know when and where to do them. And basically, any reaction, primarily SN1 or E1, that gives you a carbocation in the mechanism, before you finish that mechanism, look at your carbocation and ask yourself, can I do a shift? Now, how do you know you can do a shift? Because a single bond away from that carbocation is a higher degree carbon. I have a secondary carbon next to a tertiary carbon. And if you ever see that, you're going to look at that higher degree carbon and say, first of all, are there any hydrogens on there? If the answer is yes, then you will do a hydride shift. The way a hydride shift works is the hydrogen and the carbocation effectively switch positions. The way you draw that mechanistically is you take your arrow and start it from the carbon-hydrogen bond and draw it to the carbon that's positive. The net result is, like I said, the carbocation will now be on the tertiary position and that hydrogen will be on the secondary position. You've gone from something that was less stable to something that's more. Carbocations are super duper reactive and will always look to stabilize themselves, even if it's by a teensy bit of an amount, but it will always happen if it can. Okay, so that's the idea of a hydride shift. A methyl shift is very similar in premise. Let's say again I have a secondary carbocation, but next door to that carbocation, a single bond away, I see a carbon that is quaternary, meaning a carbon with one, two, three, four bonds to other carbons. Well, it's a higher degree carbon again, a single bond away, so I'm going to start thinking about a shift. However, unlike the situation that allowed us to do the methyl shift, uh, the hydride shift, we have no hydrogen on this carbon. That is your go-to signal that, well, I can't do a hydride shift, I must do a methyl shift. And for the record, hydride shifts are much easier to do than methyl shifts in terms of energetics. A hydrogen is small and easily removed. A methyl takes a lot more energy, so if you ever have the option of doing a methyl or a hydride shift, hydride shifts always get priority. That said, the mechanism behind how this works is exactly the same as the hydride shift. You draw from the bond of the carbon to the carbon that's positive. And again, all that's going to do for you is basically switch the positions of the carbocation with, instead of a hydrogen this time, a methyl. So I'll still have, a, that carbocation will now be on a tertiary carbon. It was formerly quaternary, lost one carbon, so it became tertiary. And the carbon that was formerly positive will have that CH3 sticking off of it. And so this is your example of a methyl shift. Exactly the same as a hydride shift, just done when you don't have that hydride to move. Now, the last type of carbocation shift that you have to be aware of is called the ring expansion. And these are the tricky ones, but they're very obvious once you know what to look for. So what is it that you need to look for? Well, first of all, as the name implies, a ring expansion should involve a ring. So let's say I have a four-membered ring. And it's a carbocation shift, so we know there should be a carbocation somewhere. Now, the way you know you're going to do a ring expansion is you will see that carbocation a single bond away from your ring, like this. Now, your first instinct, based on what we just talked about, might be, okay, well, that carbocation is a secondary carbon, and it's a single bond away from a tertiary carbon. Wouldn't it make sense to just do a hydride shift? And, well, if it wasn't a ring, you'd be right. You'd want to do that hydride shift and get the tertiary carbocation over there. However, Ring expansions actually get priority over hydride or methyl shifts. And, let's, and I'll show you why after we figure out what this should look like at the end. So, well, what does happen in a ring expansion? What you're going to do is you're going to look at that corner of the ring. That's a single bond away from the carbocation. And you're going to look 
and say, okay, what bonds in the ring are connected to that carbon? This one and this one, all right? And you're gonna pick one of those two bonds. I'm gonna pick the one on the right, but for the record, and in most cases in this course, we're gonna make the molecule symmetric, so it doesn't matter whether you pick one or the other, you'll get the same answer. I'm gonna pick the one on the bottom, however, because it'll be easier to visualize what we should get at the end. So what you're going to do now is you're gonna erase that bond. Well, actually, let's redraw everything exactly the same first. And we're gonna figure out what should this look like after our ring expansion. Once you've picked your bond, what you're gonna do is you're gonna start your arrow from that bond and have it attack the carbocation, kind of like what we did with the methyl and hydride shifts, except this time it's the bond of a ring. Now, in the thing that we drew exactly the same, we're going to figure out what we should look like after all, this, all these arrows have gone through. What you're going to do is, since the arrow starts from this bond, that means this bond is going to get erased. Next, the carbon that isn't a single bond away from the positive, that was formerly part of that bond, will now connect to the carbon that was positive. Meaning this carbon down here will connect to that carbon that was positive. Since this carbon just got an extra bond, it's no longer going to be positive. However, as we saw, this bond got erased, this bond lost that bond, or sorry, this carbon lost this bond, however, it made a new bond over there. This carbon, on the other hand, gave up this bond and got absolutely nothing in return. That means this will now be your new carbocation. Now this might look ugly, but if we count the ring, we see we have a one, two, three, four, five-membered ring. We went from a four-membered ring and increased it by one, hence the name ring expansion. And if you don't like how this looks, we can kind of neaten it up. I see a five-membered ring, so I'll draw a five-membered ring. There's a methyl off of one of the carbons, and a single bond away from that methyl on the next carbon over is a carbocation. So this is what this will look like after its ring expansion. Now, one point to make is, all right, so we made our ring, exp our, our ring expansion happen. Now we still have a carbocation that's a single bond away from a higher degree carbon. Do we do the hydride shift now? And the answer is no. One important rule to know for these shifting questions is you are limited to one shift per question. And that is just a rule that the professors and the TAs and the students will have all agreed on. To keep these questions from getting overly complicated, every, que every question will only involve one shift. The reason for that in a science perspective is it already takes a lot of energy to do a single shift. So by the time the first shift has occurred, so much time has passed in the actual reaction that you're not gonna go and do the second shift because it just is going to take even more time. By that time, most likely what will happen is the rest of the reaction will finish. That said, the first shift, as far as we're concerned, will always occur, no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, that said, we've expanded our ring, but wait a minute. We have the option of doing a hydride shift here, putting that carbocation onto a tertiary carbon, making it more stable. By doing the ring expansion, sure we made the ring bigger, but we're still secondary, so that carbocation isn't any more stable than it was before. So why do a ring expansion over a methyl or hydride shift? Because a carbocation is a small part of the molecule, and yes, it is unstable, but if you can increase the stability of a small part of the molecule, that's not nearly as good as increasing the stability of the molecule as a whole. We went from a four-membered ring, which you'll learn four- and three-membered rings are not particularly stable, and they often look to do these expansions to become the more stable rings. And the most stable ring you could ever be is a six-membered ring, but five-membered rings are still very, very stable. So the ring expansion allows you to not necessarily make the carbocation more stable, but the molecule as a whole more stable, and so it's very, very favorable to occur. And so that's why you're gonna always do it. If you have, if you want a list of priorities, it's always going to be ring expansion number one, then hydride, then methyl shift, in terms of what's most likely going to happen given the proper conditions. If you remember that, you should be good.